You can save 15% or more at Amazon when you pay with Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. Just go to purse.bogosity.tv. You can set your own discount. 5% gets you fastest delivery, or you can set it to 30% or more if you're not in a hurry. Purse makes it so easy to save money at Amazon by buying with crypto. Just go to purse.bogosity.tv and start saving now. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of January 19th, 2020. The podcast that's safe in its alabaster chamber. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's decalcify the news of the bogus. So we've talked about Warren Canaries before. The idea is that you have a piece of text saying something to the effect of, we have never received a warrant for our user info. So then they receive one, and with it comes a gag order saying they can't tell people they received it. But they can remove the canary so users know something is up. Back in 2016, as we covered, Reddit's warrant canary died, and that left users with one question. Now what? It seems that the canary dying simply didn't leave us with any useful information. The EFF discontinued Canary Watch that same year because, although they were able to track a lot of canaries, it was impossible to keep up with the different formats, PDFs, plain text, HTML, and even images. And there were some that weren't signed or updated. And overall, the system just made things difficult to keep track of. They said, quote, In our time working with Canary Watch, we have seen many canaries go away and come back, fail to be updated, or disappear altogether along with the website that was hosting it. Until the gang orders accompanying national security requests are struck down as unconstitutional, there is no way to know for certain whether a canary change is a true indicator. Instead, the reader is forced to rely on speculation and circumstantial evidence to decide what the meaning of a missing or changed canary is. Now, a proposal on GitHub seeks to standardize warrant canaries and make them useful. The idea is to make a standard format, readable by both humans and computers, that will make automated analysis possible, reduce misinterpretations, and have a scalable and decentralized means to alert users and security analysts of just how much warrant activity with gag orders there is out there. Included are specifications for a version number, release and expiration dates, and cryptographic proof of freshness in the form of a block hash on the Bitcoin blockchain. Also, three cryptographic public keys are given. The public key that's used to sign the canary, a new key to be used if the current key is compromised or has expired, and a panic key, which automatically causes the canary to fail, basically acting as a kill switch for the canary. There are also different codes representing the number of warrants, gag orders, subpoenas, trap and trace orders, cease and desist orders, duress, raids with no useful data seized, seizures likely with useful data seized, compromised credentials, and compromised operators. There is also a seppuku pledge. If set, this communicates the operator's intention to shut down and cease operation, wipe all devices, and destroy all files if there is an unsurpassable order to operate under the orders of a malicious entity. It's all formatted in a standard, open, human-readable language called JSON. Hopefully this will make Warren Canaries easier to track and verify, and give us some useful information when things change. It's very important to keep an eye on the horrible things our governments are doing, and this could be a step in the right direction. If you're tired of these promos, regular supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv and sign up for Patreon or Subscribestar at any level. Ads are annoying, but ad blockers prevent publishers from making money. What if you could support your favorite websites, YouTube creators, Twitch streamers, social accounts, and many more ad-free and without paying anything, and even make some money yourself? It's not a pipe dream, it's airtime. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and get the browser extension and you'll earn cryptocurrency for the sites you visit, and so will the publisher. This is not a crypto miner. You and the publisher will both get part of the reward from current miners of the BitTube cryptocurrency, with no middleman taking a cut. Even if the publisher hasn't signed up yet, his tube will be put into a dedicated wallet that he can claim upon sign-up. You can also use your tube to tip publishers and even purchase products. Airtime monetizes users and publishers with no ads or crypto miners. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and start making money now. 
In another legal issue, the Linux company Red Hat filed an amicus curiae brief asking the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn Oracle v. Google, a decision made by the circuit court which extended copyright protection to software interfaces. In other words, the buttons you click on and the fields you type in. Basically, imagine if a car company had copyrighted the steering wheel in the gear shift. The court ruled that interfaces are copyrightable because there are multiple different ways of designing them. But that would mean that one company couldn't design its interface to operate the same way another company's did. This decision is a threat to interoperability, as it would limit how closely one company's interface could provide the usability of another's. This is particularly harmful to the open source community, as open source projects generally don't go around getting a bunch of legal copyrights. Red Hat's customers include more than 90% of the Fortune 500, so this amicus brief may carry some weight, doubly so since it was filed jointly with IBM. They wrote, Computer interfaces are not copyrightable. That simple yet powerful principle has been a cornerstone of technological and economic growth for over 60 years. When published, as has been common industry practice for over three decades, or lawfully reverse engineered, they have spurred innovation through competition, increased productivity and economic efficiency, and connected the world in a way that has benefited commercial enterprises and consumers alike. Not once until this case has a court of appeals held that software interfaces are protected by copyright separate and apart from the code embodying the implementation of these interfaces. This is not because this principle is fringe, it is because it has always been accepted, based on legal precedent dating back 140 years. It has long been understood that software interfaces, as distinct from the software implementations of those interfaces, are not copyrightable subject matter. That is because the copyright in the work of authorship does not extend to any system or method of operation that may be embodied in the work. Whether there are multiple ways to design a system is irrelevant to whether a system is a system. The rapid pace of innovation is enabled by the ability to use interfaces that are unrestricted by copyright protection and the compatible products would likely never have been developed if, at the time, software interfaces had been viewed as subject to appropriation under the extremely low standard for copyright protection. Software interfaces provide for compatibility between software and hardware components in a computer system. They enable remote elements in a network to exchange information with one another. They comprise formal systems for denoting complex software entities. And they are wholly inappropriate for copyright protection. The Federal Circuit's unduly narrow construction is harmful to progress, competition, and innovation in the field of software development. IBM and Red Hat urge the court to reverse the decision below on the basis that 17 U.S.C. Section 102B excludes software interfaces from copyright protection. Copyrights are getting more and more ridiculous as time goes on, but hopefully this will end up being a road too far for the Supreme Court. They're scheduled to hear arguments in the spring. Here's hoping they see sense. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government censors. It's essential in this day and age, so go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world. And they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. Here's one with a fun twist. On Tuesday, as part of its regular Patch Tuesday updates, Microsoft provided a fix for a zero-day flaw in their crypto API system, which absolutely everyone should install right now if they haven't, because this one is being exploited in the wild. The vulnerability involves the secure certificates we rely on to verify that our web connections are encrypted and aren't going to someone other than the website. This bug allowed people to mint their own certificates with someone else's name on them. 
The first thing that makes this story interesting is that it's the first time a Patch Tuesday fix was credited to the NSA. Normally, when the NSA or another government entity finds a zero-day exploit, their tendency is to hoard it and use it for themselves. Of course, this makes people like you and me vulnerable, because even if you trust the NSA for some weird reason, it's naive to think that no one else will discover it. For example, the Eternal Blue exploit, as we covered, was kept secret by the NSA and was the very exploit that was used to make the WannaCry ransomware virus that ravaged the internet until stopped by the hacker Marcus Hutchins, known as Malwaretech. Yes, the same one that was subsequently arrested. You remember. But this time, the NSA gave the bug to Microsoft to patch proactively, something that, if they've done before, they haven't taken credit for it. Proof of concept code is out there that shows just how easy this is to exploit, including Python code comprised of 53 lines and a Ruby script that's just 21 lines. And that brings us to the other interesting thing about this story. Cybersecurity researcher Salim Rashid used the flaw to engage in a live attack on Microsoft and the NSA. Well, depending on how you define the term attack, he generated fake certificates for github.com and for nsa.gov, but he only put them on his own computer. He posted video of his results. It shows him apparently going to github.com, but instead of getting the website, he gets a video of Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Yes, it's a Rickroll, but it's a Rickroll that validates. The browser does indeed show a valid certificate for Microsoft's github.com, meaning that as far as the browser's concerned, everything's hunky-dory. He tweeted, Even though Chrome is using boring SSL, which is Google's fork of OpenSSL, it delegates to Crypto API for certificate validation, like lots of other software. The biggest constraints are Chrome's tight certificate policies and that the root CA must be cached, which you can trigger by visiting a legitimate site that uses the certificate. I almost gave him the silver clue on for this. If he'd been the one to expose the bug, or if the NSA had refused to report it or Microsoft had refused to patch it, I would have. Now keep in mind, this is not a social engineering attack. You're not tricking the user into thinking the site is genuine. You're tricking the security system itself into thinking it's genuine, which means that users don't have any really good way of spotting the error. The OS and the browsers themselves are both fooled by it. So if you're running Windows 10, get this month's patches, which fix this hole and 49 others which include several remote access vulnerabilities. Those could have been more dangerous than ever when combined with this bug because it would make it easier for a remote hacker to put valid certificates on your machine and impersonate any site you went to. So patch people! We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now it's time to keratinize this week's biggest bogan emitter. And it's the second one for Attorney General William Barr as he falsely blames Apple for holding up the investigation of the shooter at the Pensacola Naval Air Base. The FBI had requested any information from Apple that they had about the shooter, and they responded with everything they had, several gigabytes worth. Well, apparently everything they have isn't enough, as Barr is now accusing Apple of not doing enough. In a case reminiscent of the San Bernardino shooters, Barr is saying it's absolutely crucial that the government get access to the contents of the shooter's phone. 
If you recall, after a lot of brouhaha and the government finally paying over a million dollars to an Israeli firm to crack the iPhone in question, they found Bupkis. And it's also not clear what vital information they hope to get in this case. Complicating this is the fact that the deputy who shot the shooter inadvertently put a bullet through his phone as well. What they want Apple to do about that is anybody's guess. Barr said in a press conference, We don't want to get into a world where we have to spend months and even years exhausting efforts when lives are in the balance. We should be able to get in when we have a warrant that establishes that criminal activity is underway. The problem is, the delay isn't Apple's. It was the FBI who failed to make the request in a timely fashion. Apple said in a statement, We responded to each request promptly, often within hours, sharing information with FBI officers in Jacksonville, Pensacola, and New York. The queries resulted in many gigabytes of information that we turned over to investigators. In every instance, we responded with all of the information that we had. The FBI only notified us on January 6th that they needed additional assistance, a month after the attack occurred. Only then did we learn about the existence of a second iPhone associated with the investigation and the FBI's inability to access either iPhone. It was not until January 8th that we received a subpoena for information relating to the second iPhone, which we responded to within hours. Early outreach is critical to accessing information and finding additional options. Say, Barr, if time is so critical, why aren't you complaining about your FBI goons that took so long to make the request in the first place, and not Apple, who responded to the request in a matter of hours? Could it be that this is all just a pretext for more anti-encryption rhetoric? Barr said, This situation perfectly illustrates why it is critical that the public be able to get access to digital evidence. Hey, Barr, if you think it's so freaking important that the public have access to digital evidence, why don't you tell your people to comply with all those FOIA requests your own office has been sent? In fact, Barr has actively spoken out against FOIA. Last November, in a speech to the Federalist Society, he called FOIA requests constant harassment, saying, We all understand that confidential communications and a private, internal, deliberative process are essential for all of our branches of government to properly function. Yet Congress has happily created a regime that allows the public to seek whatever documents it wants from the executive branch at the same time that individual congressional committees spend their days trying to publicize the executive's internal decision process. That process cannot function properly if it is public, nor is it productive to have our government devoting enormous resources to squabbling about what becomes public and when, rather than doing the work of the people. Rules for thee, not for me! Hypocrisy, thy name is William Barr, as well as this week's Biggest Bogan Emitter. Do you have children, or nieces or nephews? Are you homeschooling, or just want to counter some of the socialist indoctrination most children get in school? If so, go to bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins, and you'll be taken to a website where you can get some great books for elementary age children. The Tuttle Twins books are books about liberty and free market economics that include children's versions of Bastiat's The Law, Leonard Reed's I Pencil, and Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, as well as books about the Federal Reserve and how regulations protect business cronies. They'll learn about the harm caused by eminent domain, or regulations passed in the name of safety and fundamental concepts of liberty. And as you can see from the sample pages on the website, they're all easy to read and nicely illustrated. They're just $9.99 apiece, or get a special discount as well as free bonuses when you purchase all five. You can even buy in bulk to donate to schools and local libraries. So get the Tuttle Twins books at bogosity.tv slash Tuttle Twins. And now let's emulsify this week's Idiot Extraordinaire. And this week it goes to, well, we'll get there. I have to kind of set this up a bit. So as baseball fans might know, which leaves me out, there's a Cleveland Indians pitcher named Shane Bieber. The slogan he keeps using is, Not Justin. No one has seen him use Not Killian, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. 
He wore a special jersey with the Not Justin slogan on it, and apparently he's planning a line of apparel using the phrase. As part of this, he applied to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for a trademark on Not Justin. That trademark has been opposed by Not Justin Bieber. No, really, Not Justin Bieber, which would actually make a certain amount of sense, although the opposition would still be ridiculous. No, the Justin opposing this trademark is Justin Boots. Wait. Who the heck in hockey sticks is Justin Boots? Well, apparently they're a line of Western footwear owned by Berkshire Hathaway. I was trying to figure out how big they are, but apparently they haven't released any revenue figures since 1999. Of course, it is owned by Warren Buffett, so make of that what you will. The searching I did seems to reveal that they have annual revenues less than $70,000, which isn't that great. All of which is to say they aren't exactly a household name, so the first incredibly stupid thing about this is in thinking that there's any way possible that people will confuse a major league pitcher with a pair of cowboy boots. I mean, even I can tell the difference there. The second is, as the company's size shows, if people are going to confuse it with any other Justin, why would it be this rinky-dink Justin Boots outfit? I mean, Justin Bieber, of course, then there's Justin Timberlake, Justin Trudeau, Justin Amash, Justin Lowe, Justin TV, the Chinese rapper Justin, and many others that a lot of people are bound to think of before Justin Boots. And the third really dumb thing about this is that he's saying he's not Justin. How is someone saying they're not Justin going to cause people to confuse him for something that is Justin? And, I mean, it's true. He's not Justin Boots, just as much as he's not Justin Bieber. By the way, there's no issue from Bieber, as he has a custom jersey that says, Not Shane Bieber. He's not Shane Killian either, just in case there was any confusion. Shane Bieber decided to have a little joke with his fans, and so Justin Boots made a joke out of themselves. Given that, who else could possibly be this week's... Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this Don't Bull Sty Me edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please keep this podcast going by hitting like and subscribe and supporting it in one of several different ways you can find at donate.bogosity.tv, including PayPal, cryptocurrency, or subscribing at Patreon or Subscribestar to listen early and ad-free. Also, please come to discord.bogosity.tv where you can join the discussion and post a question, statement, news article, or rant. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Clarence Darrow. Endless volumes have been written and countless lives sacrificed in an effort to prove that one form of government is better than another. But few seem seriously to have considered the proposition that all government rests on violence and force, is sustained by soldiers, policemen, and courts, and is contrary to the ideal peace and order which make for the happiness and progress of the human race. The Bogosity Podcast is not Justin, but it is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Bogosity. Christmas time is coming, and the most classic of Christmas stories is A Christmas Carol. But how much do you know about the original Charles Dickens novella? Have you dismissed it as a children's book with one-dimensional characters amounting to nothing but platitudes and cliches? Maybe your appreciation of the book was even muted by those dry, boring, annotated books they made you read in school. My book, the sarcastically annotated A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, uses both facts and humor to present the book in a way you probably haven't seen it before. Giving praise when deserved and beratement when warranted, this book is put in the perspective of its time and shows a dimensional, multi-layered Ebenezer Scrooge from start to finish. Skepticism, history, and even economics are employed to show the book in relation to today in an easily accessible format. Appreciate the Christmas of your youth all over again, Get the sarcastically annotated A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, available at Amazon and on PDF as well.